Good evening and welcome tonight to Tri-City, a wonderful gathering yet again. Isn't this getting to be a habit, going to church? Uh, let's take our hymnals and begin with a great uh, quotation from Scripture, the words of Paul to Timothy, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Hymn 388, let's stand together as we sing, I know whom I have believed. I know not thy God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeem me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart. Believing in his word brought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin. Revealing Jesus through the word, creating faith in him. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk a veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Colin, and welcome tonight to Tri-City Baptist Church, both live and in person. Good to see folks here again this evening, and for those who are on live stream, we welcome you to our evening service. To keep up with what's going on as we're in this ever-changing uh, environment at this time, as we are incrementally, slowly working our way back into on-site worship services, it is a blessing uh, to see folks. But probably the best place to keep up is on our website at www.tricitybaptist.org. You're probably very familiar with that now, but if not, please take a look at it. Uh, there you will find certain things, just a reminder that our Adult Bible Fellowships are still meeting uh, via Zoom. Uh, take a look at the website for your class. The majority are at 9 uh, a.m. on Sunday mornings at this time. If any classes adjust, we'll try to capture that and have it on our website. Also, let me highlight before I move forward, uh, a few of the adjustments this week, we will be having a midweek service, a prayer service here in the auditorium uh, for us. The team started meeting last Sunday evening out in the ball field, and we will have a children's program. I believe they're meeting in the gym as well. So if you want more information regarding that, that's this coming Wednesday. I believe I saw the time even though we had midweek prayer service at 7 on the bulletin. Pastor, I believe that it's 6.30, right? Okay, so take note of that. We'll get that, make sure that's corrected. 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday. For those that may have a benevolent need, you may have seen in our bulletin, 
that you can reach out and contact someone on uh, one of the pastors. We'd love to have you reach out to us and let us know uh, if you have a need. We'll certainly keep it confidential or if someone else has a need and would like to reach out to them and work with those situations. We do, we've established a benevolence committee and that is chaired by Phil Garcia, uh, but each of us will make contact with him and we'll work through uh, each of those situations. In just a few minutes, uh, looking forward to hearing from Dr. Brian Malik as he continues our summer series, Love That Discerns. He'll be preaching the first of a two-part series, Truth in a Culture of Lies, part one. Does anybody believe that we're actually in a culture of lies at this time, where we need just a little bit of discernment to navigate appropriately uh, through some of these murky and muddy waters? I think it's a very timely message uh, that he'll be bringing, and I'm looking forward to what he has for us. This time, we would normally take an offering. Uh, as I shared this morning, we do have boxes to try to make this as touchless as possible and experience for you. We will not be passing out offering plates, but each of the doors will be a place where you can give. But we do want to have our time of offering, and this morning I failed to pray and thank the Lord for uh, the giving. Uh, Julia Richards will come and do the offertory in a moment, but let us pray in preparation for that, as this is a part of our worship service. Father, what a blessing it is to be able to gather with folks each and every Sunday now. What a treat it is to join together in corporate worship. We are, as Peter has told us, we are living stones and we have a living hope. And being alive, we want to be together and worship together and sing. And we thank you as well for the opportunity to give and give our thanks and praise to you. And Father, we do ask that you would bless and utilize the resources that our folks uh, so graciously give. And we pray especially for those who may have a benevolent need. We pray, Father, that they would be willing to come and allow us to participate in being a conduit of your love and manifest your grace to them. But we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for bringing us through this time. And we do ask that your hand of blessing would be upon this service and that you would meet with each and every one of us as we are gathered here in Christ's name. Bless this time and this service now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Thank you so much, Julia. That's one of my favorite hymns. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Well, we're going to continue to sing about that wonderful Savior. This next song, this hymn 525, All That Thrills My Soul, is really a song of complete and utter joyous abandon. It really is, the, from the heart of the songwriter, a love song. And I hope that you can sing it from your heart tonight. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine. True and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand, in my blessed Lord I see. Love of Christ so freely given, grace of God beyond degree. See higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand, in my blessed Lord I see. What a wonderful redemption, never can a mortal know. How my sin, though red like crimson, can be whiter than the snow. All that thrills my soul is Jesus, he is more than life to At the fairest of ten thousand, in my blessed Lord I see. Every need is hand supplying, every good in him I see. On his strength in my relying, he is all in all to me. thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. By the crystal flowing river with the ransom I will sing. King. All that thrills my soul is Jesus, is more than life to me, and the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's stand and sing another one, hymn 540. A great song of our complete and utter confidence in Christ. I run to Christ. I run to Christ when chased by fear and find a refuge sure. Believe in me, his voice I hear, his words and words secure. I run to Christ when torn by grief and find abundant peace. I too had tears, he gently speaks, thus joy and sorrow be. I run to Christ when 
Well, good evening and welcome. I've been really looking forward to this. We, uh, as believers, we absolutely need uh, discernment. Uh, we absolutely need to be anchored in God's Word and to be able to see what's going on in the world today, to be able to interpret it through God's Word and to have that understanding. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, as uh, Pastor Skip mentioned, we know we live in a world of lies. Uh, some of this has been demonstrated, a lot of it, quite, in fact, quite recently. Uh, to give you an example, we have this picture was taken by a Danish photographer. Now, he intentionally did what you're going to see, but during uh, COVID-19, he took a picture showing how people were just too crowded and they were too close together and it was a problem, or he was representing that, until he took the same picture, and if you'll notice the same people, he took the same picture from a different perspective. And you'll notice they aren't too close at all, but it was all from the perspective. It was all from the angle that he used uh, to demonstrate that. Another example of that, uh, this, was, you know, this was over in France. The top picture makes it look like there's a very large demonstration. Uh, what you see in the yellow circle is the same person in both pictures. Uh, the top picture, there's a large demonstration going on. Oh, there are thousands of people here. Then you look at the bottom picture, which has a wider view and you see that it was a small group of people with a very narrow range on the camera, uh, width on the camera, and actually outside of that, nobody's there. And so you say, well, what's going on here? This is, this is what the world, what so many in the world now are doing. They are trying to basically deceive people into believing the truth. Uh, one other one to give an example. You may have been familiar with this one. Uh, this is Mike Seidel from the Weather Channel during Hurricane Florence. And as you can see from this picture, he is really struggling. The wind is blowing really hard. He's having to lean into it. If you watch the video, you see him constantly leaning into the wind. The problem happened when two guys showed up behind him just walking along like there's no problem. Okay. And so even though it looked like it was something that was very, very real, the problem was there, there was deception in making it look like something there isn't. But deception is not going on. This is not happening just in the, the secular world. There is uh, a lot of deception that's going on in the spiritual realm as well. Uh, the preaching of things that are not uh, biblical, the preaching of things that are not grounded in Scripture. And so as we look in this area of discernment, it is so important that we recognize the need for us to be discerning. So I want to start at the beginning. What is discernment? Uh, if we're going to talk about discernment, we ought to, you know, kind of look at what it is. I've got a few definitions there, a few ideas. The basic idea of discernment is the ability to judge or distinguish uh, between two things, using the wisdom of God's Word as we look at it. Uh, to judge well is the idea of discernment, uh, making careful distinctions about what is tr between truth and error. But I really like the quote that I found from uh, Spurgeon, Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. I thought that was very, very perceptive and very applicable for today. What Satan normally does when he wants to deceive us is he does not present something that's just an out-and-out -out lie. That's too obvious. 
but he mixes error and truth. He gives you some truth with some error. If we accept the error with the truth, it then becomes truth to us. We believe that's what's happening. And so therefore, so important for us to recognize what he does and the way that it works. Uh, we need to be critical in this. We need uh, the word of God. We need the spirit of God to reveal this to us. Uh, 1 Chronicles 12, 32 talks about the sons of Issachar who were able to discern. Uh, and of course, we know from uh, Acts 17, the Bereans were more noble because they compared, they took what was said and they compared it to the word of God. They said, what does the word of God say about this? And so we recognize today there is a call, a biblical call for discernment. In 1 Thessalonians uh, 21 and 22, prove all things, discern all things, test those things that are approvable, hold fast to that which is good, and abstain from all appearance of evil. I find this to be very interesting because we are told to, to be discerning. We're told to discern that which is good, and, and not necessarily just to discern that which is evil, but that which has the appearance of evil. And so it is so important for us to recognize this distinction, and it is we are told to do this. We are to prove those things. Uh, this is a call to us to do this. And so, uh, and again, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, we see this as well. And so there is a biblical call for discernment. We need to be discerning. The scriptures tell us why. There are several reasons. First of all, we are warned against a lack of discernment. Uh, Proverbs 14, 15, the simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his own going. You know, for a while especially, there were people who, if they saw it on the internet, they believed it. If they saw it on national news, they believed it. And I think there are still some who hold to that. But, you know, I think we need, just need to remember the words of Abraham Lincoln. Don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture and a quote next to it. Okay, so it's important for us to remember this. But seriously, just because somebody says it doesn't make it true. And so it's important for us to recognize the, dis the, the danger that there is for a lack of discernment. We can easily be turned astray. We also need to recognize the fact that not everything that appears to be true is actually true. Uh, 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen 13 through 15 tells us, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Just because somebody claims the name of Christ does not mean that what they're saying is true. You know, Christ himself said, there are many who will say, Lord, Lord, did not we, do, we, not, we do many wonderful things in thy name. And he says, depart from me, I didn't know you, you workers of iniquity. We have to be so careful that we don't simply give credence to somebody because of something they claim or because of something that they say that maybe we would tend to immediately agree with without discerning. Are what is what they're saying true? Is it valid? Have we tested it against the word of God? It's important for us to recognize if we aren't discerning anything that appears to be true, we are going to tend to immediately believe. And once we do that, we have accepted falsehood, and now we have mixed falsehood and truth. And it becomes very difficult for us to honor the Lord and to love him and to serve him as we should when we do that. Uh, also, under the need for discernment, we need to recognize that people are going to actually desire to hear error rather than truth. And one of the things that we have to be very careful of is what you might refer to as the herd mentality. And that is that because a number of people believe this, it must be true. Well, the fact is, if everyone believes something that the Bible says is true, is false, but they believe it to be true, it doesn't matter how many people believe it, it's not true. And so simply by quoting or by saying, and I'll be talking a little bit about this more next week, by simply saying something along the lines of, well, Everyone believes this, therefore it must be true. That doesn't make it true. In 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 4, 4, we are exhorted to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season, to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall, heap, shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, 
and they shall turn away from their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. We are to be discerning. We are also to recognize that we have an opportunity right now to share the gospel to a people who have not, perhaps, gone past the point of listening to truth. When we see what's going on in the world today, we recognize that lie after lie, um, deception after deception are being thrown at people. And the sad thing is, as you look about, as you look at it, more and more people are accepting the lies as truth. They're accepting the lies as the way it should be. Uh, it's just interesting when you, when you read numbers of studies of people who are coming out of college, of college students, the, the number of lies that they believe to be true because that's the way it's been presented to them. And they have assumed that because their teacher is telling them this, it must be true. And the fact is it's not, and we need to be very, very careful about this. Because without this, we're at risk. Without discernment, we are at great risk. Ephesians 4.14, this wonderful passage, tells us about the purpose of the church and the gifts that, that are given to the church, but the reason they're given that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You see, if we're not careful, we're going to fall into that category. We're not going to be well-trained in the truth. We're not going to be understanding of God's word. We're going to be susceptible to the lies. You know, it's interesting, even the world today recognizes the, not, the amount of lying and the, the number of lies and deceptions that are out there, and now you have a number of sites, including places like uh, Facebook, that have fact-checkers. Of course, do you put your faith in the fact-checker? That's a whole nother issue, and I'm not going down that road. But the fact is, even they are recognizing there is a lot, there's a lot of information out there that's just not true. And we even are going to act like we're going to try to do something about it. There is more and more. Now, this isn't new. This has been around as long as sin has been around, okay, as far as lying and deception and all of that. But the fact is now, through the internet and through other ways, there's ways to disseminate this that's in ways that's never been done before, in the volume and in the impact that can be made. So as believers, we need to be very careful. So the question then is, if we want discernment, how do we obtain discernment? Well, how we work on it is going to be the subject for next week, but what are the foundations that we need for discernment? First, we need truth. We need the truth. In John 18, a very famous passage where Pilate asks Christ, what is truth? Pilate is actually somewhat asking or seeking or searching. But the fact is, the question he asks is so important. Truth is one of the foundational things that we need to be able to discern. We cannot discern. As God would have us discern, we cannot have that discernment without truth. And so we must have that truth. It is the most powerful way to correct error. That's simply it. Okay, there's nothing else to be said about it. Truth is the only way to correct error. So many times in the world today, you see error that people try to correct or change through other errors. But through a maybe more palatable error, uh, a more palatable lie. The fact is, that doesn't fix anything. That doesn't correct anything. We have to have truth to correct error. We're going to need that. Secondly, we need the foundation of biblical truth to eliminate our, our feelings and opinions. You know, there are a number of people today who believe, who accept something as true based on how they feel about it. And if we're not careful, we can fall into the same thing. If you think about it, if you read a news article and you agree with the point of the article, are you not much more likely to agree that, to think that it's true? But if you read something that has an opposing view, are we not much more likely to say, no, that's wrong. That's fake news or whatever you want to call it. The fact is we are very susceptible to this. We have to be very careful about this. Uh, I've, seen this, I've seen this as a bumper sticker. I've heard people say this all along uh, for years. And it's this little phrase, 
The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. That's really not a very accurate statement. The Bible says it, that settles it. Doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. When the scriptures say it, it's true. My opinion about what it, what it is doesn't change the truth. But the thing we have to be very careful of is that we don't allow our opinions or our feelings to dictate what we believe or what we accept to be true. It's got to be compared to the Word of God. It's got to be held up to the truth of Scripture. Otherwise, we are going to start to accept things. We're going to accept things that are not true. Because they feel good. They agree. We agree with the sentiment. And that happens. And you find all the time. I see many times on Facebook, Christians who post things and then later on have to say, sorry, I thought this was true. It wasn't. I should have checked it. But the fact is, it, it, it sounded good. We agreed. He, they agreed with it. So let's put it out there. We can't do that. We've got to be so careful. With truth, not only is it the power to correct error, and not only does it eliminate the problems of having fe the, the feelings or opinions that can change it, but third, it is the final authority. God's word provides the final authority for what is true and not a true. It doesn't change. Truth is not relative. Truth is absolute. It never contradicts itself, and it doesn't change. And that is so important for us to understand, to grasp hold of, and to hold on to. I have talked to, I have, I have a number of times talked with people who tell me, no, no, truth is not absolute, it's relative. And, I, and then there is no absolute truth. And of course, the immediate thing I always ask them, are you absolutely sure? Because the fact is, what they are saying is they are making a statement that is absolute in nature, while they're saying there is no absolute. You see, lies will compound lies, and deception will compound deception. When we're confused, when we don't know what to believe, we have a place to turn where there is no confusion. We have a place to turn where there is no contradiction. We have a place to turn that we know is always true. The Word of God is there. We must con compare everything to the Word of God. That is our foundation for truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 tells us this. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it gives us the reasons for it. And the fact is, that is how we become a complete perfect in Him, through His Word. So we need to recognize, so important. Now, this is not saying that the Bible contains all truth. You say, careful there, Brian, what are you saying? No, there's truth, for example, mathematical equations, things like that. But what we're saying is everything in the Bible is true, and everything that, nothing, nothing that is true will contradict anything in Scripture. And so it's important for us to recognize it all goes back to Scripture. You know, now, if I was to say, well, I am just going to live by the Scripture, and, I'm, and I don't need anything outside of Scripture, but the Scriptures itself teach us to look outside of Scripture. Romans 1 tells us that God is revealed in nature. We look at nature to understand more about God and His creation. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6 tells us to observe the ant and to gain wisdom about productivity. Uh, even Paul in Acts 17 talked about referenced Greek philosophers. Uh, to make an intellectual case for the truth of Christianity. But the fact is, everything that is true will be consistent with Scripture. There will be no contradiction. And so as we recognize that, we realize, so the question we ask then is, what does God's Word teach us about the truth? Well, first of all, it teaches us the truth of the Christian worldview. How do we know what to believe? How do we know what to interpret? We know that through what the scriptures teach through the worldview. John 20, 30, and 31. Uh, many other signs did Jesus in, his, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing ye might have life through his name. That's the foundation of our Christian worldview. It's given to us for that reason. We don't have to ask God, how should we think? We don't have to ask him, what should we believe? It's been given to us, and it never changes. When I was uh, 
when I was growing up in Gunnison, I had a really good friend, uh, Kevin Malone. Uh, he was, his family was Catholic. And I remember one, one Monday he came and he was really, you could tell he was really bothered. And I just asked him what's wrong. And he said, my mom and dad are thinking about leaving the Catholic church. And I'm like, why? What happened? And he said, they have been told since they have been so young that to eat meat on Friday is wrong. That to eat fish. Well, they don't like fish. So what they would do for all their married life, what they have done is they've waited till midnight Friday night to have dinner. Okay, so they didn't eat meat on Friday. They waited to have dinner uh, that late. And he said, now the Catholic Church has come out and said, now it's okay to eat meat on Friday. And they are, and it, it, it shattered their faith. What happened? Something that they were taught was true was now being said, oh, it's not really true. And it was supposedly a foundation of what they believe. It was a foundation of what they believed, but the fact that it became untrue or became not foundational anymore to their truth completely destroyed their faith. When we want to develop a worldview that is consistent, that is, con that is continual, that does not need to change, how do we develop that? If we develop it on anything outside of the Word of God, we are going to fall short. We need the truth of the Word of God to do that. God's truth provides us with the gospel message. There are, how many ever religions there are, that's basically how many ways there are to go to heaven. Okay, everybody has a little slight, diff slightly different version of it. And the fact is, how do we know the truth of the gospel message? We know the truth because it's in God's Word. The truth of God's Word. We cannot... Be true to God and change the message. We cannot remove the necessity of the shed blood, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We can't do it and be consistent with God and his word. There are a number of denominations that have removed all of the hymns about the blood of Christ because it offends them. Well, sin offends God. Okay, offense happens. But the fact is, they're offended for the wrong thing. And so rather than deal with truth, they've made changes so that they don't have to be offended anymore. They have accepted the lie. They've deviated, departed from the truth because of that. The truth we are taught is that Jesus Christ is the truth. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the truth. Anything else is a lie. Any religion that does not recognize Jesus Christ as one of the Trinity, as a person of the Trinity, as the Son of God, as God himself, 100% man, 100% God, if they change that in any way, they have departed from the truth in any way, shape, or form. We are taught the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. John 14, 17, he is called even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot deceive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for ye dwelleth, he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. We don't hear a lot of times a lot about the Holy Spirit. And we need to understand the Holy Spirit working in our life is critical for our desire to please God and to be discerning. He leads us and guides us in all truth. We will not understand truth without him. The Holy Spirit is so important for that. God's word is truth. And there are a number of verses that you can quote there. John 17, 17, very simple. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy, through thy truth, thy word is truth. God's word is true. Anything that conflicts with God's word, contradicts God's word, changes God's word is not true. That's it. Do we believe that? Or do we allow ourselves to listen to other thoughts and ideas that are not in concert with God's word, that are not in agreement with God's word? If we do that, we're allowing error in. This foundation of truth is so important. Christians are to believe the truth. Uh, John 8, 32, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You say, well, isn't this rather obvious? 
The problem is Christians may acknowledge the truth, but they may not always live the truth. They may not believe it to the point where they acknowledge it to the point where they live it. When we are testifying of God, when we are sharing the gospel, when we are um, standing in defense of the, of the scriptures, are we tempted to come up with our own examples, our own ideas, our own way of trying to get somebody to believe? Do we try to come up with our own line of argumentation or reasoning so that people will be gravitate toward that? Or do we believe that the word of God is sufficient? Do we believe that the word of God is foundational? So important for us, not just to, with our head, acknowledge, yes, the word of God is true, but to live that truth in our life. Next, Christians are to be grounded in the truth. Having discernment is work. There's no two ways about it. It is work. We've got to study God's word. We've got to exercise our faith. We've got to research and dive in and develop. But the fact is, if we're going to be grounded in the truth, we've got to be studying God's word. We've got to be working. We are told to search for silver, to search for wisdom as for silver. We're to dig, we're to work. You read some of the stories about the, what the miners did when they were coming out here looking for silver and gold and other things. The work that they put in. Do we put that kind of work in? Or do we pick up the scriptures, read it for five minutes in the morning because we know we should put it away if we do that, and then we say, okay, the rest of the day is mine. Are we setting time aside to study the scriptures, to be grounded in the faith? Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word. How can we hold it fast if we don't know it? If we haven't studied it? If we aren't in it? Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the naysayers. If we're not grounded, we're not going to be able to help others. If we're not grounded, we're going to be floundering instead of helping those who are floundering. We have to be grounded in his word. That requires work. That requires the time and the effort to be in his word, to study his word, to develop an understanding of his word. We're to speak the truth. You know, one thing that we maybe can do is we say, okay, I believe God's word and I try to live God's word, but I don't share God's word with others. No, we are called to be prepared to do this. We are called to be ready to give an answer. Proverbs 8, 7, my mouth shall speak truth. How many times when we're in a difficult situation where the not, there's a, not, a lot of people who are opposed to what we believe to be true, who are opposed to what God says to be true, how many times do we just sit on the side and say nothing? How many times do we have an opportunity to share the truth of God's word? And yet, what do we do? We have a lack of discernment. Instead of discerning that God has given us an opportunity to share his word, we look at what might happen to us. Our focus is on ourselves, and we don't speak the truth. We are called to speak the truth. We are called to teach the truth. It is so important for us, not just to understand the word and to make it real in our lives, we are to then share that with others. I like 2 Timothy 2.15. It's the, where the Awana, an acronym, comes from. But the idea is very simple. What we, and we're making, we, we are to make disciples. We are to take what we have learned through God's word, and we are then to share that with other faithful men who will then share it with others. It is so important for us to understand that discernment is a living thing that needs to then be shared with others. Why? Foundational in this truth. The Word of God is teaching us this truth. We're to rejoice in the truth. Now, that can be really hard when the truth is hitting you between the eyes. It can be really hard when you read God's Word and you're being convicted, and then you sit there and say, wow, I should... Uh, I should rejoice in the truth while God's word is convicting me that, man, I am really messed up. That is not fun. Okay, but you notice the word of God doesn't say be happy with the truth. Rejoice in it. Why? Because the truth is going to help me to be more conformed to the image of his son 
The truth is going to change my life so that it is better and it is more. And the closer I get to the image of God's Son, the closer I get to what I am supposed to be through God's Word, the more my life is going to count for the Lord and the more I am going to be blessed. Everything gets better as I draw closer to God. And when I've got sin in my life and I've got things in my life that I need to deal with, when I get hit with that in the scriptures and the scriptures tell me you've got problems with this area, deal with it, I need to rejoice because God is not letting me get away with my sin and hurt, continue to hurt my life. It's an opportunity to rejoice. We are to live according to the truth. This can't be just head knowledge. Psalm 25, 5, lead me in thy truth and teach me for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all day. In 2 John 4, John was writing and he said, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in the truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. We are to walk in the truth. It's not just head knowledge. It's got to change our life. It's got to be truth that has an impact in what I'm doing. And then last on this list, we are to worship in truth. I'm so thankful that the worship here at Tri-City is based on the Word of God. I am so thankful for that because that is what we are called to do. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth. And our worship must be founded on that. And if we ever stray from worshiping in truth, then we need to shut down because that is what God has called us to do. So truth is foundational. Foundational for us, it's foundational for discernment. Second is obedience. Obedience is necessary for godly discernment. 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. These are commands. Whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone in the world. We are to try the spirits. John 7, 24, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. It's not talking about judging people. It's talking about judging, is this true? It's talking about judging, is this consistent with the word of God? We are commanded to do this. Discernment is not an option for a Christian who desires to love God and to serve him. We cannot effectively do that without discernment. And so we must have the truth of God's word, but we must also be obedient. And without that obedience, our discernment fails. We will not succeed as God has called us. A third foundation is love. You know, the entitled, we, we've entitled this whole series, Love That Discerns. There is love. First of all, a love for God. You know, how does discernment show love for God? Well, God wants us to defend his gospel. He has given us the privilege of being the apologists, not apologizing, but through apologetics, making a defense of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, which I have preached unto you, that also ye have received, wherein ye stand. We are to defend the gospel. When we defend the gospel, we're demonstrating a love for God. Defending the gospel is not easy and usually not very comfortable. We don't do it because we get this warm, fuzzy feeling that says, I go home and I go, well, everybody loves me because I did that. We do it out of a love for God and a love for others. We want to defend his truth. He has given us that to do that. Second thing that it does is it allows us to demonstrate that it shows us we, that we have to identify the sources of error that may be influencing our life. You see, it's so important for us to recognize, and going back to 1 John 1, 4, 4, 1, we are to try every spirit. Why? Because if we love God, we're going to live for him. If we love God, we're going to choose what he would have us to choose. How do we do that? We try the spirits. We test what we hear against the word of God. Lord, I love you. I don't want falsehood changing what I believe. I don't want falsehood affecting what I do. I want to live for you. If I do that, if I love him, then what am I going to do? I'm going to check to make sure that I am not allowing error in my life or in the lives of those I love. 
God wants us living in truth. Why? Because he knows it's best for us. Because he loves us. He loves us so much, he gave us his truth that we would be guided by it. So we demonstrate love for God in that way. God loves truth. Those who oppose God oppose his truth. If I am receiving lies and accepting lies and I'm not filtering those lies, I'm opposing the truth. Therefore, I'm opposing God. Do I really want to oppose God in my life? If I love God, I'm going to be seeking his truth. I'm going to be discerning to know what he would have me to do. If we love God, we're going to expose false teachers. We're going to recognize that God has called us to stand for truth. That is not an easy thing to do. You know, if you, if you share the gospel today and you tell people that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, most people are going to call you narrow-minded, bigoted, and they're going to say that you, you don't have a love for anyone. You don't love people. If you loved people, you wouldn't tell them that. Well, first and foremost, if I love God, I'm going to share the truth, his truth with a world that needs it. And second of all, if I love people, I'm going to share the truth because a lie isn't going to help them. So part of what I am doing when I am discerning and I am sharing God's truth, when I am developing my discernment, I am understanding, is I am knowing how to and what to share that is true. I'm discerning from that. Part of that is in recognizing those who are teaching falsehood and exposing that. If somebody, if for example, if a doctor claims that he can treat cancer with some kind of new cure, and that cure is untested and unproven, and the government finds out it's not working, and in fact it's hurting people, what's that, what are they going to do? They're going to shut him down. He's not operating in truth. He's not operating on a basis of knowledge or science or understanding. How much more important is eternal truth and somebody's spiritual well-being? that we are presenting the truth. If we love God, we're going to oppose those who are opposing God. And then we're going to live our life so we're not fellowshipping with those who would be, who are false teachers. Now, I'm not talking about not fellowshipping with any believer because if we don't fellowship with unbelievers, it's going to be very hard to share the gospel with them. But this isn't talking about unbelievers. This is talking about false teachers. Those who have taken a position in which they are intentionally teaching that which is opposed to God's word. I'm not going to fellowship with them. I'm not going to listen to them. I'm not going to be drawn into them. If I love God, I'm going to stand on the truth. And I'm going to recognize that. Not only do we demonstrate love for God, we demonstrate love for others. We have to demonstrate. We demonstrate our love through truth. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. When we share the gospel with someone who does not know Christ, it may sound harsh. And we need to be careful that we're sharing the truth in love, that we're not being harsh in our presentation. But the fact is, if I tell them anything other than what is true according to God's word, and I deceive them and I make it simple for them and easy for them, what am I doing? I'm not showing love for them. I'm showing love for myself. I'm saying, man, I want this to be as easy as possible. And so I'm not going to tell them the hard truth. I'm going to make them feel good, and I'll feel good. I've shown no love for them. I've shown love for myself. When I share with them the gospel, and I say, listen, you know, I understand you have a lot of hesitations about this. You understand why did God do it this way? But this is what he said, and I will show you from his word why he said it and what he says to do. Then I'm demonstrating love for them because I'm sharing the truth that will Bring, that can bring salvation. I must, de I demonstrate love through truth. I also, to be careful that when I'm doing this, that I avoid argumentation. I want to expose false teaching, but I want to do this with love and kindness. Uh, Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in him all things which is head even Christ. 2 Timothy 2.24-26 really speaks to this. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, 
in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. See, when I share God's truth, it's got to be in love. I've got to have a love for others as I try to help them be discerning and understand what is true and what is not. Again, the foundation of discernment is on truth. And a demonstration of my love for others is in the way I present that truth. I'm not trying to win the argument. If my goal is to win the argument, I've already lost because the focus is on me. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this several times in my ABF class. Oftentimes when talking with somebody about the gospel and they're opposed to the gospel, my goal is just to, I believe it's Greg Kukul who originally said this, um, put a pebble in their shoe. Just get them uncomfortable with what they believe. Get them thinking about it. Because for me, most people, it's going to be a process. But am I doing that in love? Am I demonstrating a love for them? When we are sharing God's word and we're, we're speaking with others, we must be very careful to listen to what is said, not jump to conclusions. Proverbs 18, 13, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. How many times have you been in a conversation, you ask somebody a question, and the answer you get back has nothing to do with the question you ask? Somebody wasn't listening. But how many times do you say something and they say, well, that's not what I was referring to at all? And you realize, I jumped to a conclusion. I said something based on what I thought they were going to say. I said something based on what I wanted to say, not listening to them. We need to be patient listeners. Part of discernment is understanding when to listen so that we can collect information, so we can gather information, so we can know better how to help the person. So it's so important for us, we recognize that. When we are speaking with, in love, we are presenting God's word. We are not giving our own opinions, we're not telling them what makes us happy, but we're giving them scripture. If we love somebody, we're going to point them to the truth. We're gonna point them to the God who gave us that truth. We're not going to try to win them with our own ideas, our own opinions. And then in this section, we have to be humble. We've got to do this with a desire to love them and to seek their salvation, to seek their growth, to seek them in developing their discernment. If I'm doing it for my own reasons, if I'm doing it for whatever, if I'm not humble, I'm not going to be able to serve them and to love them as I should. Now, how does discernment help us? Let me just wrap up in this. Uh, we talked about the foundation, the foundation of truth, the foundation of obedience, the foundation of love. If we don't have those, our, our discernment is not going to be as effective and as, it, as it can be or it should be. Discernment helps us, first of all, because it, is protect, it protects us from being deceived spiritually. Uh, Ephesians 5, uh, 15 through 17, see that you walk circumspectly, means carefully, looking around, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the day, time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That understanding, many times in, in the King James especially, the word understanding is actually the root word means, um, uh, means discernment. We are to be discerning. What is this telling us? We need to be alert. Walking circumspectly, we need to be alert. If somebody, you know, a World War II gives us a great illustration of this. There were times when troops had to go through a minefield. They knew the mines were there. So what happened? One person went in front, checking very carefully for the mines. What did everybody else do? Followed in their footsteps. Because they knew if they had stepped in this spot, it was safe to step in. They were walking circumspectly. They were walking carefully. We are to walk, we are to live carefully, not just accepting lies, not just accepting falsehood, not walking around with, with a lack of discernment, but we need to recognize we need to be wise because the days are evil. So we, it helps to protect us from spiritual deception. The second thing it does is it helps us to provide healing. 
We can't provide the healing. God's word provides the healing. If we are discerning, we can understand what someone needs from God's word and help them with that. There is a really fancy term for that. It's called counseling, biblical counseling. Sharing God's word with people, helping them through their difficulties, showing them what God says to do with that. You see, if we're discerning, we are able to help people. We're able to take them from where they are, share God's word with them, share God's truth with them, and help them to grow. Whether it's in salvation or in sanctification, we're able to help bring them closer to the Lord. Not because of what we're doing, but because through discernment, we understood how to use God's word to help them in the situation they're in. God's word gives us that ability. Third, God's word and discernment functions as a key to our freedom. You know, it's interesting when tellers go to work for a bank. Um, I, I read a story about this, but it was from a bank about 100 years ago that when a new teller was hired at the bank for six weeks, all they did was look at money. All they did was study money, studied it forward, studied it backwards. They were tested on it, retested on it. And then after six weeks, they could start to act as a teller. And a reporter heard about this and went in and saw the operation and asked the bank manager, why do you do this? Bank manager said very simply this, if they can recognize a true dollar, a real dollar, they can easily recognize a fake. And the point is, discernment helps us to be free in the truth of God's word because the more we are discerning, the more we can immediately understand what, that is, what is wrong and reject it. We're free to live in God's word. We're free to live according to his truth when we are able to discern and to filter that which is untrue from that which is true. When we don't have that discernment, we are constantly second-guessing and questioning and wondering, is this right? Is this wrong? Should I do this? Should I not do this? And it robs us of the freedom of serving God, as he would have us to do. You see, discernment provides freedom for us. And then finally, discernment helps us to grow spiritually. It's a catalyst for our spiritual development. Proverbs 14, 6, a scorner seeks wisdom and find it not. But knowledge is easy to him that understandeth. And that word understandeth means discern, to him that discerned. There's no such thing as a safe dose of poison. When somebody says, I'm going to offer you this, um, and it's, got, it's mostly good, but it's got a little poison, we're going to reject it all. But if they offer it to us and we don't recognize there's any poison, we may take it. The fact is, discernment is important, is critical for our spiritual development. Without it, we're going to be caught up in lies. We're going to be taken the wrong way. We're going to be unable to continue to grow as God would have us. And so is discernment something that we are willing to work for? Do Christians automatically have discernment? No, they don't. It's very clear. How many Christians have been deceived through various false teachings? And, and sometimes we look at it, we go, wow, that was so obvious it was false. But it wasn't to them. They did not have discernment. And they went after the lie, believing it to be true. No, Christians do not automatically have discernment. We have automatically, as a Christian, we have everything we need for discernment. We have the truth of God's word. We have the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth who's guiding us. We have what we need for, for discernment, but we don't automatically have discernment. We have to work for our discernment to grow. We have to study. Are we willing to do the work? Are we willing to be in God's word? Are we willing to be studying? Are we willing? Do we love God enough to say, I want to be Someone who has discernment so, God, you can use me as effectively as possible. Do we want it that much? Do we love God enough? And do we desire to serve him enough where we are willing to do the work to obtain 
to develop the discernment we need to serve God more effectively. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you this evening, we recognize that all of us fall short in this area of discernment. That none of us have obtained all that we can and should have. But Lord, I thank you that you have given us all that we need. You have helped us, Lord, by equipping us. But now you have called us, you have told us to develop discernment, to grow in our ability to discern. Lord, we look around the world today and we realize we need it more than ever. There are so many lies, so many half-truths, which are lies, so many deceptions, and we are subject to falling into them without discernment. You've told us to get understanding, and you told us to get wisdom, Lord, you've also told us to get discernment. We need that. Help us, Lord, to be a people who are willing to do the work that is necessary to develop discernment in our lives, that we might be more effective in our service for you. We thank you so much for your love for us and for all that you have given us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to demonstrate our love for you in our willingness to do those things that will help us to be more effective in our service for you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Pastor. Wow. Amen. Thank you, Brother Brian. That was tremendous, wasn't it? Wow. So thorough, so comprehensive. Um, for the guys who are following him preaching through the series, there's no other verses left uh, except one. I, I found one verse you haven't touched on. It was in Hebrews 5, but strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It's the only verse you left untouched next week. <laughs> All right, next week, we look forward to that. You say that again? Are you using that one? It's the only one that wasn't touched. That's one of those, one of those messages you want to listen to again, take the notes, and let that all sink in. Um, very, very rich, very comprehensive. Thank you so much. What a good night. Uh, what a good day to have you here this evening. And many of you here were here this morning. What a blessing. Um, great to be back. We are incrementally working back into these type of services. Uh, this Wednesday, we take the next step by adding some of the children's ministry and the uh, Bible study and prayer meeting, which will begin at 630. And then the youth will continue their meeting uh, this Wednesday night. So we're, we're making some headway. And I think we're very encouraged by that. Well, if we're going to stand together. We'll close here in prayer. Thank you for joining us. And some of the guests who are out this evening, welcome. Good to see you. Good to see Kevin's daughter with us and son and all. Good to have you folks here with us. I forget from where. Is that uh, Iowa? Wisconsin. Uh, yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah, great. Great. To, yeah, all the same. Yes. <laughs> Yes, okay, great. Well, good to have you here this evening. All righty. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, last week we uh, looked into your word and we saw how Paul prayed for the church, for the believers at Philippi to, to see their love increase and that their love would be a discriminating love, a discerning love, uh, to be able to discern that which is excellent prove those type of things and to to just mature with this quality that was so capably covered this evening. Uh, Lord, we, we are living in an age where we know the world has no discernment for they have denied the truth of your son and salvation. So how can they be examples for us as it relates to spiritual truths? So Lord, um, we, we, we must be a discerning people and we are constantly stupefied to see believers who are just so, they're, they're so dull, they're so undiscerning. And uh, we know that part of it, they are not exercising uh, spiritually in studying and digging into the word and applying it to life and coming out with the right conclusions and judgments. So Lord, help us. May the spirit of God increase our love and may this love be a discerning love. Thank you for this good day you've given us. I'll uh, get safety as we head home. 
Thank you for the fellowship we've enjoyed here today. In Jesus' name, amen.